book. Oh, there is a title there. Okay, there we go. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, as a reminder, if you are joining us here in the Zoom room, we will be on Facebook Live, which we are now <laughs> live. Uh, and so I would like to introduce myself. I'm Clementine Bordeaux with on, here on behalf of Racing Magpie. Just want to welcome everyone to this exciting presentation as part of our seasonal programming called Winter Camp. We have Anthony presenting uh, a, about two spirit regalia making, and we're very privileged to have them with us today. If you don't know, Racing Magpie is a Lakota centric arts and culture organization founded in 2015 here in Rapid City. Um, in Mini Luzaha Otuahe, which centers the Lakota practice of being a good relative in everything that one does. Our, fo our focus is elevating and amplifying the ongoing work of community based artists and culture bearers in the region. And as part of being a good relative, this program reimagines the Lakota winter camp model of problem solving, storytelling, and community building in today's world by examining the deeper cultural roots and the ways that Lakota people do things and how we interact with the world around us. Uh, although these events are open to the public, uh, they will always uplift and amplify those community members and culture bearers that are part of the Ocheti Shakoin communities. So uh, we also want to thank the Bush Foundation for their generous sponsorship of this program. And if you are looking for other ways to support Racing Magpie, you can always visit our website, make a donation, stop by our new space here in Rapid City, or you can always, always support our artists. And you can do that by following them on social media, buying their artwork, sharing out their beautiful crafts, uh, and is supporting them directly. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live and you have a question or a comment for Anthony, you could always drop it in the comment section. I'll be monitoring Facebook. Or if you're joining us in the Zoom room, um, we will have opportunities for you to engage uh, in the presentation later. So without further delay, I'm excited to introduce Anthony Kagagi Tanka. Hello, I'm Anthony Kangi Tonka. I am from the Pine Ridge Reservation. I was born and raised here for the past 20 years. Um, today, I wanted to talk about um, my history with regalia and um, my experience as a two-spirit individual within my, within my community and um, share some stories from other two-spirit individuals and just kind of like, give give information on how um well at least in my experience go on with my journey with regalia making as being a two-spirit individual so um let me okay let's start at the beginning so this is one of my favorite photos ever um i made i made my dentalium earrings I made my skirt and I made my belt. I didn't make my um, medallion or my top half of the earrings, the beaded half, and my uh, my mask. The medallion was made by a Dene woman that my mother gifted me on my birthday. But this is in front of the Badlands, and it's one of like it's my one of my favorite places on this earth. It's on my reservation, and um, every time I go to Rapid City, I stop by it and. I try to take pictures and I think it's really nice to take place to take pictures. But um, when I was making this skirt, right, I made it for my, um, I made it for my grandma and grandpa's wedding. They were together for um, six, over 50, 60 years and they never got married. They were boyfriend and girlfriend for that like, entire time, but they had eight kids and um, during that time, they never got married so finally one day they just decided to get married and it was really special for me to see that i didn't think i'd be able to see my grandma and grandpa getting married but it was really honored for me to um wear that skirt and wear that belt and yeah um i really love that skirt i kind of um i kind of just went with anything 
I really like those colors. I've always liked like the sunset colors. And uh, I found this, I found this thick, um, this thick ribbon. It was like almost, I think it was like two inches long. But um, I found that ribbon in my closet and I just decided to put it up the sides because I saw a TikTok on how to like um, to put the ribbon on the side. And it was really, um, it was really easier than I thought. So like when you're putting those up the sides and you're about to sew up your skirt and you have the two panels already sewn with all the ribbons on them, you just, um, when you're, when you sandwich it inside out, cause you know, when you're sewing up the sides together, you're going to have that, you're going to have both of those sides floated inward. So the ribbon's going to be on the inside, but then you're going to take a piece of ribbon. You don't, however long you want it to be, but, um, on the side and you flip it in half. And that's going to be the link sticking out of the side of your skirt. So then you, when you're sandwiching all that stuff together, you take that side with the fold on it and you stick it, you stick it on the outside. So that ribbon that's going to, so, you know, it's going to, it's going to lay right there and then you're going to sew it inward and then it's going to flip out when you turn it inside out. But um, that's like the most simplest way I could try to put it. But yeah, that's my explanation on how to do that. But I really like how, um, that lays and stuff like that. And that was my first time ever doing that. So I wanted to put a lot on there, but that's just kind of like, that's just kind of my vibe. I'm like over the top and I like things to be really extravagant and really pretty. And um, so I ended up putting those up the sides. And then I did like, uh, I did, I think I did two black pieces. I did all white down the side, two black pieces in the middle. Then I did one little red piece, as you can see right there. But yeah, for my belt, um, that was kind of like a, a learning process within itself because when I do make these pieces, I, um, I'm really critical on myself a lot of the time. So I'll look at something and then I'll think like, how can I make this better? Or like, how can this be better? And then I'll just think of like an idea that I wanted to do. So I'll end up taking a lot, a lot of things apart and then um, putting them back together or adding onto it or taking off of it. So like this belt with the side drop button on my um, side right here, uh, that changed probably like three to four times. I took, um, I kept taking conchas off and kept putting them on because it was too long and then it was too short. And then I wanted to put these little, um, these little end point things on, on the bottom that I got at Prairie Edge. And so that's what I ended up doing. But um, I really liked how it turned out with that little thing on the bottom. But yeah, this is one of my favorite pictures. And I'm, I'm glad I got to take it because it really represents me as an individual and my people and where I come from. Um, I've lived here my entire life. And although I identify as Oglala, Shichangu, and Northern Cheyenne, um, this is where I was raised. I don't know anything outside of Lakota culture. So um, this is who I am. And um, yeah, let's just move to the next one. But let me see. Okay. So this is a little more like um, in depth on what I was wearing. Let me see if I can zoom in. Um, oh no, I'm going, sorry. Okay, go back. Okay, so I don't know. Can I zoom in? Yeah, I don't think I can zoom in, but um, yeah, so this is a, a more in-depth picture of what I was wearing at the time. You can see um, at that bottom, I have that little point and I usually wear like, I like to wear really um, plain shirts with my skirts. I think this is the style that really makes me feel like I'm empowered, you know, like when I'm wearing this, like I feel my best, like I'm at my best and no one can tell me anything because I feel like the most piteous person in the world. And um, yeah, so this was a really good day. This was my 20th birthday. I just um, left being a teenager and um, it was a very, it was I don't know, like becoming an adult is, is a very, um, I wouldn't say scary transition. It's it's a it's a anxiety inducing transition transition because it's a lot of things that I'm going into that are new. 
So um, yeah, this um, this is my next skirt. This is my um, tribute to the Two Spirit Oyate within Lakota culture. So as you can see, um, the feathers, the two feathers coming out of the turtles and the lizards represent the Two Spirit Nation. And the lizard and the turtle in the middle represent the two um, genders within Lakota culture. And so I wanted to connect those two and make a representation of me because as I identify, I am Lakota Winkte. And um, and the if you want to say like the literal translation of it is like a man who takes on the women's roles. And so I wanted to create a skirt that represented me as an individual. And as you can see, like um, I was told um, a story by uh, Candy Brings Plenty, and she was telling me about how like uh, her dad was telling her that um, us as two spirit individuals, we pass through the Milky Way like this. And I always thought that was so beautiful. And um, so I made the skirt out of that message where us as individuals, these little um, these little star things that the turtle and the lizard stick in, those represent us as Lakota beings because we come from stars. And the um, the green line in the middle represents the Milky Way. So we, so that's where we return to and that's where we come from. And uh, the the fabric, the blue, that's my favorite color. I love blue. Like <laughs> I'll wear it every day. But with this, um, this outfit was entirely new. This took me a, a good while to make. Um, at this time, I was going through a lot. And this was a lot of fabric, to be honest. Like, when I was doing these feathers, right, um, the fabric wasn't thick enough to, so that, the fabric wasn't thick enough to be able not to see the ribbon under the white fabric. So I had to sandwich it. And there was maybe one, two, three, there was probably like three layers of fabric sitting on that one feather. And it was like, it was kind of thick and it was real heavy. So um, those took a while doing each one of those feathers, but it was, it was definitely a learning process, this skirt, how to do applique work because I've never done it before. And um, this was my first attempt at it. I really like it. It took me a long time having to do um, each one of those feathers individually. And it was my first time using like this, um, this like squiggly stuff that's on the end of, um, I you call that like bias tape. I think that's called bias tape. But um, yeah, so it was my first time using that as well. And uh, I wouldn't say it was as challenging as I thought it would be, but it was definitely like trying to keep it straight on the edge of the ribbon. That was my biggest challenge with that. And everything else I loved. Um, after the after this photo, I cut these little side things. I really like the little side things on the skirt. Um, when I took this photo, I didn't get a chance to cut them with like how I wanted to. So after this photo, I, I corrected that. But um, yeah, so going on to my earrings, um, those earrings that I'm wearing in that photo are the same ones I'm wearing in these photo but I ended up taking them apart. And um, I always saw these like pair of earrings that, you know, I'm wearing them right now, but I always saw them with the black, with these brown spacers in the middle. And I always like wondered how to do that. Like I saw um, some big indigenous artists doing that. And for years I was like messaging people and be like, like, do you know where you bought those type of earrings from? So I can ask them like, how do you make those? And then um, I'd reach out to like bigger indigenous influencers, like not even like being able to reach out to them, but just like emailing them and being like, can you please tell me how to do this? <laughs> like, um, yeah, so I ended up redoing them in that style. And I kind of, I just did it off of how I thought it would be done. So, and that's kind of like the experience that I have with all of my pieces. Like no one teaches me how to make these things at all. I just kind of look at them and think like, okay, well, if like, you know, just kind of, com well, common sense within my mind is like, okay, well, this thing goes through here and this thing goes through here. So let's just like recreate that. And um, that's how my pieces go. I wonder sometimes, I really wonder like if there's like a book out there or if like there's these classes or something that are supposed to be teaching us all of these things. And it's not like people like, 
I'm just wondering if there's like every other indigenous artist is out here like just doing the same thing kind of like learning as you go but um yeah I kind of just put them together the way I thought they should have been put together and I like their end result like I, I still have them but with um with the breastplate necklace that one was really challenging because um the leather was really thick in between the spacers and I wasn't I wasn't thinking it was that thick but when I was putting the Glover's needle through the spacer, I had to use the pliers on both sides. And it was, a lot of, it was a lot of wear and tear on my hands. And it took me a good while. I end up watching, I watch a lot of TV shows while I'm doing my work. And that breastplate necklace took me like three, like, you know, like three seasons of special victims unit to finish <laughs> like and um yeah but I really like how it turned out I saw this I saw this indigenous artist she did the same thing and but hers is like her, her she um she placed her cones more spaced out than I did and um she used she didn't use like she didn't make it the same way I did because I felt bad I didn't want to copy her so I was like okay well I have to purposely make this not the same way she's going to make hers but you know hers was really 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 pretty and um yeah so I ended up getting a bunch of white cones and then um stacking them the way I wanted to and it turned out like this and I really really liked it I really like um I really like the lightness of it it's a really light piece and it um it's really durable, like it's wearable, it hasn't broken yet. And yeah, so, and my belt, my belt, that was probably, that was the easiest thing I've made in this piece. And I was really, I'm really happy about how it turned out because I, in the past I've been making like thinner belts and this one was like my first like four inch thick belt. And I really like how it fits because it's snug and I wanted to, it won't fall off, but with this skirt, like it needs a thick belt because it's a really heavy skirt. So if you're not wearing a belt with it, it's just gonna like keep sliding down and you're gonna keep having to pull it up. But yeah, I really liked how this turned out and I'm really proud of it. It was really cold outside when I took this picture too. Like I was, um, um, I had my mom take, oh, come with me outside in front of the house. And um, we ended up just like standing outside, like hurrying up to take pictures because I was freezing and it was like negative <laughs> five. But I really liked the um, how the snow came out and everything. And I, I'm thankful for her because she she um she was telling me like not to wear a blue shirt because it's going to be too much blue. So I really liked how she was helping me out with the colors and stuff like that. And she told me to wear this pink shirt. But um, yeah. OK, let's go to the next one. So this one is the first tea dress I've ever made. And um, this one I kind of just did on a whim. Um, I was like, okay, well, if I think I can do it, I can do it. And I didn't look at a tutorial. I just, um, prior to this, my cousin made me a tea dress and she made, she made, um, she made mine out of the, out of trade cloth fabric. And, um, Trade cloth fabric is really expensive. It's like between fifty to ninety dollars a yard, and um, like even on before that, or like more than that. So I ended up taking a um, a fabric route with it, and I already like studying the dress that she made me for a while. I kind of figured out like where like what to cut and stuff like that. But it was still a really challenging piece because it was my first time ever making one. But like um. I think the most challenging part about it was just the shoulders right here, like connecting the shoulders to the dress, the rest of the dress was probably like the difficult, the most difficult thing I had with it, to it. Um, I added my, um, my breastplate necklace and my earrings and my belt onto it. But this dress probably took me um, four days to make. And um, if I could change anything about it, I'd probably change the the length of the sleeves but I really like the um the colors on the sleeve like I wouldn't change how much ribbon I put on there I would just probably just change the length of the sleeve itself and 
I guess I was kind of like rushing through this because when I was putting it together, I, both of the both of the side pieces didn't um didn't match up. Like they were just different. Um, the, the colors were placed differently, and I did that like. I always find when I'm doing that, when I'm sewing, like I'll mess up and then I'll come back way later. And it's like, how did I even not see this? <laughs> but yeah, I really liked how it came out and I had to rip it apart and put it together at least two to three times. But as like new sewers and it's, um, I understand like it's a difficult process sometimes when you're trying, when you're really like excited to make something, you just like forget to to make to, about the little details like that but yeah I'm really proud of this dress I still have to put bias on the edge around because the ribbons are fraying and that's something I have yet to learn how to do let's put bias on things um this next picture is my is my friend Charlie, she created this skirt and this breastplate necklace for me. And I'm, I love it. I'm, I'm in love with this so much. Like I'm so proud of her for making this for me. And I, I'm so thankful for her. I've never had a, um, I've never had a skirt that I've been, that's been made by someone else. So getting this was really special to me. And I wanted to make sure that they, they matched. So the breastplate necklace has these little um has these little blue horse hairs on the bottom which i think are are super super cute because they match my earrings too and i just have this like golden this like gold black like brown aesthetic like at this point like black and gold are like my favorite color regalia wise like i i want to like make a i want to make a black and like silver belt or like a brown and silver belt like I've just been kind of sticking to black and gold because those those are what I like personally but um I definitely have to branch out to those colors and so yeah <clears throat> she made these for me um <laughs> a month ago and she took this picture for me we took this picture in her backyard but I I'm absolutely in love with it okay and then we'll move on to my earrings so like my my experience with um jewelry making i started in 2019 prior to the pandemic and this is like i started off making um i made a medallion and that probably that took me three weeks to make and at that time i was friends with um i was friends with this person who actually became my mentor and they taught me um they taught me a lot of how to make things you know they um they gave me the encouragement to start making things and they would give me pattern help and they would if i was stuck on something they would just be there along the way to help me and um they became my mentor and that's when i started making jewelry because I was working at Subway at the time. And I remember like, I was just like, I don't wanna go to work. I just wanna stay home and make my jewelry. And he was giving me the encouragement, like that's what you should do. And so that's what I did. <laughs> I just, I quit my job at Subway and then I started making jewelry and I've never looked back. And so I started off making dentalium earrings because I thought they were like the most, like I still think they do. They're like the most prettiest earring in the world. I just love dentalium shells, like I'm obsessed. And um, like the Talium shells and turquoise jewelry are like my two favorite things in the world. They just make me so happy. But um, yeah, so I started off making the Talium jewelry and I watched like, I watched two, two videos on YouTube. They were super helpful. So I'd say anyone wanting to start to make jewelry, YouTube is like, YouTube is the biggest help. Like, um, and these are the types of styles that I made. I really like a um, a real basic style, like a traditional style, in a sense. Like um, I really like the abalone shells on the bottom and just the dentalium. But these these are two um, two pairs of my favorite earrings. 
Um, all of what I make at this point is, uh, every, all of what I make is for order. So my order process is like when, um, when someone may book something with me, I'll, um, I'll do it prepaid for like materials and shipping and all of that stuff like that, because, um, I don't have enough to like buy these materials. So I get the payment from the person and then I go out and buy the materials and then I put it together and then that should be enough to cover like the shipping and stuff like that. So these were two orders that I made for two people that I know personally. And um, I really like these pairs of earrings. Like I wish I, I wish I would make something like this for myself, but I, I'm always making things for other people. And then you know how it is. Like you always make things for other people. And then when you get around to yourself, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. But like, <laughs> Yeah, these are two of my favorite pairs. And then we go on to another two pairs that I made, sticking with the same um, style of the shell on the bottom and just the plain um, dentalium at this time. I was doing these, uh, this is when I just started to like, this one on the left was probably like maybe uh, my third or fourth pair that I've ever made. And I made this for my breast, my best friend, Braylon. And the other one was for an order by a good supporter of mine. Um, at the time, these ones were the longest ones that I've ever made. And I was using a, I was using a nail filer and I was filing them one by one with like, um, with like a nail clipper and like cutting them and stuff like that. So like, they would take me forever. And I, my hands would just be like all cramped up because I didn't know what a Dremel was back then. And I didn't like, as I like went on with my journey with Dentalia, I started using a Dremel and that has made everything so much better. Like I've, um, I've cut it, cut down my shell shaving time for like a whole earring it would probably take me like 10 seconds. Like it's just easy. And I'd recommend anyone who's making Dentalium earrings to Invest in a Dremel because it will save a lot of time and it's really clean. And I'd recommend that you wear a mask because dentalium is, if you get it in your lungs, it's, it causes cancer. Um, it's one thing, one thing I'm always very cautious about is to wear, wear a mask when you're shaving shells at all times. And when you're wearing, um, like wear eye goggles or something to protect your eye because they will like fly off and try to hit you in the eye. And that's really bad, but yeah, these, um, the next ones, uh, this one on the left, I, I made this one for a good supporter of mine and this choker, I love the size of the shells on these, ch on this choker. I haven't, it's very rare sometimes that I get like a good big bag of dentalium and when I do I like the people who like order from me that then and there they're going to get the good stuff right because the good stuff's going to go first because everybody's just obsessed with dentalium and I love that but um yeah so I made this choker and these earrings for a good friend of mine and I put it on red fabric and took a picture of that I'm always very like wary about how I present my work that's still something I'm working on I feel like I need to do a better job on um, taking pictures of my stuff as something I need to learn. And this, the second one I, I made more recently and I made this one for an order for a good friend of mine too. But as um, I think I mentioned that before, these, these spaces, when they're flat like this, this is what I've known to like be a Lakota style on how um, we used to place dentalium. There's been like pictures from like, 1800s of people making when they do dentalium they do this style where it's like flat and um yeah that's a, that's my favorite style overall but it's just a it's a lot it takes a little longer than the regular style and these are some of the smaller pairs that I've made so far um the the one on the left was a part of was a part of an earring order that I did about 
it was two years ago. It was the biggest airing order I've ever got. It was from a trading post in Idaho and they wanted six pairs of each style that I did. And at that time I was doing four to four tiered intelium earrings and I was doing three tier. And then I was doing um, the one tier with the, with the necklace attached to it. So I had to make about like, I had to make 18 pairs of earrings and going to school at that same time, that stressed me out. Like, I, I don't know how I did that. I ended up like um, pushing it off for a little while because I was already going through a lot within myself. And um, I had my friend, because this was probably like the last, like crunching time, I needed to get this stuff done. So I was in school and we were at the dorms and I had, um, I had one of my good friends help me put them together. Like she stayed up all night with me until like seven o'clock in the morning. And we spent all night making detalium earrings. Like I made one, I made probably, I made, I finished them. And like, that's what, of like, I finished all of the earrings, but like, that was a really like stressful time. <laughs> I, I mean, I loved it too. Like, you know, it was definitely a bonding moment that me and my friend created with each other, just shaving shells all night. But um yeah these are the type of shells that I used to work with I wish I could still make these little earrings but somehow I can't find these little um I can't find these little tiny one inch abalone shells anymore they're so cute and they're like so small but um this was another pair that I did um continuing with like the simplistic style of it and I want to try different different styles of like this bottom part like maybe not using a metal hoop on the bottom and maybe putting more of these little earring hooks with like the two dentalium on the top I think that's kind of I think that looks cute but um yeah these are some of my smaller ones I haven't really made smaller ones in my in my history of just being an indigenous artist because my vibe is very big and extravagant but I definitely like, I love doing these and I will do them if any, if like someone orders them. And this is another pair that I've did. These are, these shells I found at, um, at a secondhand store, but I thought they were super cool. And it like gave me, it gave the earring like a, um, the, the earring like a seventies type of like retro style, you know, like neon, like it was cute. Like, and these ones on the right these are my favorite pair um these are the ones that I'm wearing right now those ones are 17 inches long and thank you Charlie yeah um these ones are 17 inches long those are the ones that um I recreated Okay, so these are a couple more pairs that I've done. These white shell ones were, were a journey within themselves because for the longest time I was looking for white shells that had double the holes in it. And I was really scared. I never actually tried to like, um, I never tried to actually put holes in it myself because I was always just nervous to, um, to crack the shell and I just want to have it anymore. So, but when I got the Dremel, then that's when I started using the Dremel and then I put holes in it and that made things a lot better because it was a lot faster and I was able to make those earrings. And on the right side, yeah, those those are the one, those are my favorite pair to date. Like th that was my first time ever using horsehair on a pair of earrings. And I'd recommend like maybe doing it in a, like if you're gonna use horsehair, um, in my experience, it's a really messy material. And even if I like try to be as the cleanly, like as cleanly as I can, like it's still gonna get everywhere. You can't help horse hair just like getting all over the place. So um I'd say just be mindful of that it's gonna get all over everything. And yeah, I'm still finding out like new ways on how to do earrings or how people do earrings I know like some people don't even because when I make mine I have one continuous string like going up and down like this and it just that connects the whole earring but 
I know some people like I see a lot of people do a different things where they'll tie it at the top and then they'll do individual ones like that and then they'll tie them at the bottom so it doesn't have one continuous stream and then there's some people who do them one by one so they'll tie they'll, they'll tie it off on one and then go through put all the dentalium on tie it off in the bottom and they'll just do that for all of them so each of them aren't connected and I have yet to try those styles but I really want to with my new pieces but these ones are just the ones that are connected like that. I'm thinking that if someone were to do the one where they're um, tied like by themselves, just one strand, those would probably be a lot straighter than mine are. But um, with mine, you could see the example that if you do one long continuous string, it's probably not going to come out as straight as if you did it the other way. And um, yeah, those ones, these ones are not as long. These ones are probably, the ones on the right were probably like 14, 13 inches maybe, but the spacers really make them a lot longer than they were right here. And these were my breastplate necklace era. I, I haven't done much breastplate necklaces yet, I've done two, two of the ones on the left so far and one on the ones on the right. That's the one I was talking about where I had to um, string them up one by one. And you can see like on the first one, I put little silver cones on the bottom and squished them like that. I definitely think now as I've grown, I, as I've grown as an artist, you learn different techniques and you learn how to do things a different way. So looking back on this photo, I would um, tie the bottom strands off at a certain way so they wouldn't um, they wouldn't uh, have that little thing in there. But yeah, these one, this one was this breastplate necklace with the little thing on it that was made for a family member of mine, and I'm really grateful for them, and I'm happy. I'm really happy to make this piece for them. These little, um, these little tiny spacers, I got those when I was in Albuquerque. Um, that was my first time ever riding the train to Albuquerque. So it was a very, <laughs> it was a very fun experience. And I got to go to a lot of, um, I got to go to a lot of stores that had supplies and they were really like at a cheap cost. Like I, I remember buying one of these, uh, a bag of these little spacers for like a dollar. And there was like, I don't know, they had to be like a hundred of them in there. But it was a really big bag for and the colors. Um, I really like the color selection as again, my mentor was um a big help when I couldn't figure out um my color scheme. It's kind of difficult sometimes for me to figure out my color scheme. So that's why I tend to shy towards like gold or brown, white, like the aesthetic within the one on the right, like that's my aesthetic. And with the hoop earrings on the top of these that used to be on there, I saw this picture of this Lakota man and he was like, it was from a long time ago, but, but he had dentalium earrings and they had hoops in them. And I thought that was so cool. So I wanted to try that out and I ended up putting hoops to these and they worked for a while, but they were just too heavy. Like, I think the hoops made them too heavy at that point, but I really wish they did work because I really liked that. And then this going on into this being like zoomed in on the breastplate necklace that I wanted to show you. Um, as you can see, like all of the little gold cones doing them one by one and um, having to go through there. Some of the, like some of the layers on the, on the spacers were really thick and some of them really thin, but you can't, you can't see that from this angle. And I wish I could show you that. But. Yeah, this was my breastplate era. Um, I really want to do my breastplates in the future. Uh, this was my um, like full breastplate regalia era. Um, I'd done three or four breastplates so far. And they probably take me, they've taken me around six to eight hours to complete. I would say that, um, 
you wanted to learn how to make something, this is one of the easiest things you could probably learn how to make. Um, but sometimes it, sometimes they get really loose and I'm still trying to figure out how to prevent that. But I heard from other indigenous artists that that's like, that's like a reoccurring problem. So I'm not too worried about you having to like, because that's just something probably you're going to have to do. You're going to have to maintenance something and it's not going to stay the same way forever, no matter how hard you try. And, um, so yeah, I, it takes me six to eight hours to make these breastplates. I sell them for a minimum of $300, um, depending on what size they are. It takes me between four to five or even six packs of the, the, um, spacer bones. And these ones are the four inch. These ones are the, um, the four inch bones that I've used on both of these. Uh, I noticed at my local trading posts, they have the, you know, like the actual bones because these ones are made out of the plastic ones and they have the actual bones. So I really want to try using those ones. The, the ones that are at the trading post, they're thinner than these ones are. So um, I'm wondering what kind of difference that would make. Um, the one on the left was the one I used for my personal regalia. And on the side of that, they have the two hair ties. And I really liked it. I was obsessed with it. Like I was so proud of that. Um, and then the one on the right, um, that was an order I did for a lady who um, wanted it for her daughter. I, um, I don't know, like you can see them. She wanted little red beads. So I put little red beads on each of the um, spaces on the bottom. And then I made her that little matching choker on the top. So I'm really hoping like wherever she's at now, she's enjoying that. It was a lot of fun to make those. And um, the one I have, the one I have right now, the one on the left, that one I haven't used in a while. I ended up taking the, um, I ended up taking the hair ties apart like I do to almost everything because like, again, when I look at my projects and I'm, I'm so critical, sometimes I'm always thinking like, how can I make that better? What can I do with those materials? Because I'm not, I don't have as much resources as I'd like to. So I end up having to take something apart in order to make something new because I don't have, you know, you just don't have the resources to buy new, new materials. And so you just take things apart. <laughs> um, yeah. So then we go into my belt era and the main reason why I started making belts is because of the scarcity that dentalium was starting to have um like post after the pandemic started because it's like from my um from my knowledge that you know Trump banned trading with China and that's uh, that's where a lot of dentalium was coming from and so um yeah, dentalium got scarce and I was trying to figure out what to do because at that time I was making dentalium earrings and that's all I was making. So <clears throat> I wanted to branch off to belts and I always thought, you know, like they weren't that hard to do, but I definitely was challenged by that thought because they they are hard to do. Like they, they, um, they took a toll on my hands, but I love, I love the way that I, I do my belts personally. Um, I took a lot of inspiration from traditional, Lakota, like traditional um, Weon's belts. And I liked the style of having all of those conchos from big to little coming down to coming down the sides. And with this, this one on the right, that's my most popular belt and for my sales like that's the one I sell the most and on the left those are all the types of belts that I sell in general I I have this the skinny one with the one side drop that one's my personal belt and then the one on the right with the two pointy things that one's my personal belt this one um in the left photo the one up here without the pointy things that one was an order 
And then this one right here with the thick, with the thick band on it, that one was for a good friend. And those, that one was for an order too. But yeah, as time goes on and stuff like that, I even look at these belts and I've taken them apart and um, I'm still trying to like figure out because as I wear these pieces and I wear them just to like every day and stuff like that, because that's what they're essentially for, you know, because um, I get a lot when I wear these pieces outside, like when I'm going to the store, or when I'm going to Rapid City or when I'm going to the town, you know, you get a lot of like um, people asking, like, are you going to do a powwow? Like, are you, what are you all dressed up for? And, you know, sometimes it's just, it's just for me. It's just like, it makes me feel good inside and it makes me feel really powerful. So I like to wear these items. And in my experience, as I'm wearing them throughout the day, um, I try to look at like what I could do better next time. If I was to make another belt, like what problems am I having with this belt that I could fix on the next one? So um, with the one that I'm working on, with the belt that I'm working on right now, it has these two side drops because those are my favorite things, these side drops. And I made the, I made the top part of the belt thicker because I didn't like how it was sitting. So I didn't want to buy a whole new belt. I just took apart this one on the right and then I made a new one. And um, yeah, so I'm still trying to figure out like how to make them a little more durable, how to keep the... Um, concho sticking to the material because as they're as how I was taught how they're made I make them I put holes in the material and then I I string the conchos through the back of the material with sinew and sinew is not to sinew is not designed to last forever it's gonna slip it's gonna fall but I'm trying to figure out like what material I could use to make them stick to the belt and you know I, I don't mind having to keep an upkeep but it would be really great to figure out these things <laughs> in the future you wouldn't have to be doing that um yeah I've made a good amount of belts so far um there I probably made one two three four five six I probably made about nine nine or ten belts so far um I just love them I love conchos I just I really want to as I said before I really want to like um or I'm pretty sure I said this before that I really want to branch off onto the colors of how um I make these I want to try the gold ones and I want to try um I see some people like doing using more of these little ribbits and just like doing the entire belt with ribbits on it like I think those that, that would be really cute too and you know there's a lot of styles of people like who do belts and I see a lot of people like on Instagram who do leather leather work and their stuff is amazing and that's like the level that I want to get on with contra belts but I definitely see me like continuing to do these um I'd say the most challenging part would be the buckle itself I'm still finding different ways of like putting on a buckle and watching different ways of how people do put on their buckle and some people don't even put on buckles they use um string and when I, I my first belt it was like that I, I um I tied it up in the back but as the day went on and stuff like that you know it would like come loose and you would keep having to tie it up and um yeah so those are those are the ones that I made And these are just some examples of like how the belt would sit on my um, my skirt. You see the thin one right here and the thicker one next to it. This thin one, I, I like wearing just throughout the day because it's really movable and um, it's not hard to bend down. In my experience, these thicker belts right here, it's kind of like harder to lean over. <laughs> yeah. And um, I don't really know how the the I wouldn't call it a maybe a style trend like of wearing the wearing the conch like the belt over the skirt and um as my as time goes on like I want to do um I want to add like maybe like a medicine bag and like a knife sheath I see like on my belt 
and see how that looks. But I really want to like figure out how to style in like our traditional items with everyday life. Like I, I want to make that accessible somehow where, you know, like wearing regalia, it's not um, physically difficult to do because, you know, you have all these pieces that are moving and you can't expect them to stay on all the time and you have to like move a certain way like I know that I have to with my with my belts and my drops and stuff like that when I get in the car I have to make sure they're in because sometimes I squish them in the door and um or I have to make sure like everything's set before I have like you know just a lot of moving parts so I want to figure out how to make those um better and this this is the last slide on my presentation. This is my dear friend, Angel Wide Eyes and mentor. And she was the one who got me into makeup. And I wouldn't be here today without Angel. Um, her, her and her partner um, run a YouTube channel called uh, um, Navajo Man in Lakota Bay. And they're pretty, they're amazing. They have two wonderful children. And I made this belt for Angel. Um, she did this photo shoot. And I was so happy because no one ever sends me pictures of my work. Like, you know, I'm always asking <laughs> how, um, how, like, if they could take pictures and stuff like that. You know, they're obviously not required to, but it's something I really would appreciate when I'm, like, taking orders and stuff like that to see people, like, actually wearing my work. So I was very grateful to get these photos. And um, have her permission to use them in my advertisements and yeah um so those were those were all the photos that I have today and I was and um now I'm just wondering if there's any questions or anything else thank you Anthony um there was a question earlier if the um the skirt and the 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 necklace piece if it was you said charlie and they were wondering if it was charlie cooney um who made the 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 skirt for you and oh um my my cousin yeah. charlie brewer big curl made it for me oh, okay She's another yeah. traditional artist oh cool located um, in and then you had some affirmations on Facebook. Uh, Wanapi Sapawi said, these belts are so beautiful. And they added, um, I have all of the materials to make a belt, but I'm hesitant to start. And this encourages me to create. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would say if you're around the Pinage area or if you're in South Dakota or just anywhere they, um, that has this store, it's called Tandy Leather, and that's where I got, that's where I've get, uh, gotten all of my belt stuff so far. Like, it's a pretty much a one-stop shop. They, even in the store, they'll help you put things together. Like, I didn't know how to put a buckle on the belt, and they walked me through how to put it on, and they, they even gave me, like, a little diagram on how to cut the leather and how to put, like, the little stuff on, but I go there, I go there all the time for when I'm making a belt, so I believe in you, and um, yeah. I believe in you so much and thank you. Uh, and then they also asked if there was a way, where can people contact you if they would like to order something or chat with you? Um, you could contact me at, um, right now, the main social media form that I'm using is Instagram. So it'd be um, Anthony Kongitanka, no spaces. I don't currently um, have a Facebook, but um I that might change I'm just taking a break from Facebook right now um I'm enjoying my time on Instagram cool I dropped it um and those of you in the zoom room I dropped the angels YouTube Navajo man in Lakota Bay um as well does anyone in our zoom room have any questions for Anthony? I want to say thank you guys for your time today, for listening to me and 
for hearing my story. I know I didn't get to share everything that I wanted to, but it's a long, it was a long journey. I like to say that um, every two-spirit individual has their own um, unique experience with the Galia, like how um, comfortable someone could be with wearing more feminine presenting regalia, more masculine presenting regalia. It's all a journey within yourself that's like, it's really powerful and really moving because as you see, as you wear these pieces, they are really empowering. Like I feel no one can stop me when I'm in a ribbon skirt. And that's, it's just something, it's like a gift, you know, that we're able to have these things that give us so much um, motivation and um, like reason to keep going. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think it's, um, I really liked what you said about the everyday, like we need to incorporate these things back into our everyday life. Um, oh, another question, do you do one-on-one -on -one lessons to teach relatives how to create? Have you thought about that? <laughs> um, yes, um, we've, I've done one-on-one -on -one lessons so far. I did a two-spirit camp with partnering with First First People's Fund and the Two-Spirit Nation. And during that camp, we taught how to make ribbon skirts and we taught how to make dentalium earrings to the youth. So um, yeah, I've done one-on-ones before and I'm open to doing them. Um, I just haven't done them over Zoom. So if you wanted to do it over Zoom, that's something that we both have to learn how to do. <laughs> be a learning process. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. Um, are you, do you, are you all planning to do another two-spirit camp like you did for the ribbon making skirt or the ribbon skirts? Um, yeah. So at this moment, um, I'm pretty sure we're planning on doing another one. There's been a lot that's happened this year and, um, we've all have our things that we're going through, but, um, the goal this summer is to do what we couldn't do last summer was to do all of the in-person stuff. So with the camp, we wanted to, um, we're empowering youth through their cultural identity as two-spirit individuals within Lakota culture. So we want to do like, we're going to do a coming of age camp where they can get their Lakota name and they could do all the ceremonies and they could get their regalia all in one week. So they're not doing these things separately because a lot of these things cost money and um, these kids can't afford them. So we want to make sure that these kids can afford to be a part of their culture and learn all they needed to all they need to know to go forward in life with um with the tools that they need i love that i would love to support you all this summer Thank um you. Well, please utilize me yeah. we could also uh we i know kenny ramos is one of my good friends he's kumia he's in the zoom room but we we both would just love to be voluntold what to do um to help with the two-spirit camp Oh, I love that. Thank you. Um, but thank you all for joining. I know we're almost at our hour time. Oh my God, Kenny's in the chat saying, yes, tell me what to do. I will help. Um, but yes, I agree. I think, Everybody thank is. you so much, Anthony. I just, part of, you know, when we invited you to present as a part of the winter camp, I think we really need these conversations and also just this is our everyday life, right? Uplifting and centering our two-spirit relatives and making sure that um, we're represented in these conversations as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share out um, all of your wonderful work. And I look forward to seeing more of it down the road. Um, as well as I know you're also a student, so don't forget to prioritize going to class and finishing those things as well. Mm. Um, but do you have any closing thoughts or comments? I just say thank you for presenting today and um, taking your time to be here with us and everything that you do. And um, thank you all, thank you all again for listening to me and asking me questions and being involved and. Um, I just saw the comments. Thank you, Kenny, so much for your kind words. And thank you, Pita Sami, for being here. So, and everybody else on the Facebook Live. But thank you guys again. So, have a good day. <laughs>